A lot of folks were somewhere in between. So the big question that we had a lot of people getting issues with is everything that goes into calories in and calories out and how one can influence the other. So remember guys, when we're in that caloric surplus, meaning we're getting in extra amounts of carbs, fats, and proteins, we tend to increase not just our thermic effect of food because we're eating more food, but we also tend to increase our non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which in turn can make it a lot more difficult to still gain weight. Now, on the flip side, when we happen to be in a caloric deficit, thermic effect is going, effect of food is going down because we're eating less, and we typically are going to be decreasing our NEAT because we're not going to be moving that much because we're not moving. And so it's going to become even harder to keep that caloric deficit going. So making sure you understand that one can wag the other. And also as you become lighter, you literally burn less calories doing the same amount of exercise. In the antithesis of as you become heavier, you burn more calories while you're carrying that heavier body. So both of those things are going to help actually resist. And not to mention, as you lose weight, your resting metabolic rate goes down. And as you gain weight, your resting metabolic rate goes up. So all those things kind of have their own way of kind of becoming slight uh, rate limiters. Uh, Raquan, do you have a question, bud? Okay. So now, why do we care about carbohydrates? Well, a number of you guys had a good question is, because I know I've said it before, there is no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. You can live the rest of your life without carbs. Now, notice there's a difference between survival and thriving. So yes, you can survive not taking any carbohydrates, but think back to exercise physiology. What, what is gonna be the duration that you're, let's just say not gonna be that great if you're trying to get through the rest of your life without carbs? What's gonna be the duration of exercise intensity you're not gonna be able to do very well in? Yes, Randall. Now when we say moderate durations, give it a numerical value. So like what period of time we're we really talking about. Thanks, you pining to go outside. Yeah, anything that takes an hour, but it's a range of time, guys. It's a range of time. So it's like you will suck at anything that takes one hour. If it takes 59 minutes, you're fine. A minute and one, you're fine. One hour on the dot, garbage. Think wider, guys. It's a much wider range of period of time. All right, Kennedy, can you unmute yourself? Yes, Trenton, great job there. Exactly. I was going to uh, pick on our resident. Oh, I'm going to do it anyways because you're you unmuted. So in the wonderful sport of basketball, how long would you guys really play before you had a timeout? Um, like five to six minutes before like media. So like okay. six minutes. And so what type of uh, defense were you guys running? Uh, man. And then sometimes we would go zone, but man. Okay. And how exhausting is it to do that man for five minutes? Exhausting. <laughs> yeah. And as Trenton put up there, notice once you go over that five seconds, you're having to rely a lot on carbohydrates. So yes, as you have lived, Kennedy, and a lot of you guys have felt as well, when you're playing a sport like basketball, you're playing even a sport like football, you're going to need carbohydrates to keep yourself going. And specifically to keep yourself at that really high work rate we're talking about. Now, if you want to go out and run an ultra marathon, you want to go out and do 100 miles of pain in a day, you want to go do an Ironman triathlon, yeah, you might be able to get away with doing that on carbs. But if you want to play a real sport that people care about, you're going to need some carbs. Now, I say that and it is a denigrating thing because now I've just made fun of me for being a power lifter. Let's face it, no one really cares about it. Or making fun of long distance runners for the things they're doing, which is impressive. 
but no one really cares about it because speaking about sports from the American context, we're really talking about basketball, football, baseball, and then maybe then we're getting into hockey. And all of those are definitely going to have big carbohydrate needs. So we want to store a lot of those carbs, obviously inside the muscles we're going to use in the form of glycogen. And then we have it stored in the liver also as glycogen that can then be freed up and go throughout the rest of the body. Now we're going to regulate this blood glucose through the use of insulin to bring down our blood glucose levels and glucagon to bring it back up, depending on what we're doing. And obviously the higher the exercise intensity, the faster we're going to go ahead and deplete that. So notice here, guys, when we're looking at our, our muscle glycogen levels and then our exercise intensity, you guys can see when we're looking at being at higher intensities, we can rapidly decimate our glycogen levels. And so if you're thinking about you're going to go out and play, you know, a legit high intensity game of basketball, well, each of those halves is 20 minutes. So in theory, it's you still get a little bit more rest than that. And you're going to be using a lot more aerobic. You're not going to be all be above 120% of your VO2 max. That just sounds horrible. But you're still going to risk getting a major depletion of the glycogen. And that's why the big thing that we're going to learn tonight about carbohydrates is, yes, we want to make sure we're taking enough carbs to support our exercise. We want to replenish them quickly after exercise and a little bit during if we can tolerate it. And then we want to make sure we're ready for if we have to do repeated bouts. So AKA you've got a tournament weekend where you got to play two or three ba uh, basketball games or soccer games on the same day, which is going to be a huge, huge energetic demand upon your body. So remember the carbs we're digesting along with that being freed from our glycogen is going to be what's in our bloodstream. And the bloodstream is going to be where we're going to carry it to the muscles that happen to need it when we're exercising. Now, if you think back to XFIS, that first line, we also talked about energy breakdown in this class, the first enzyme in glycolysis is what's known as hexokinase. Now, inside of the liver, it's what's known as actually glucokinase, which is fascinating because it works both ways. With in the muscles, hexokinase, it goes one way. It comes in the cell, gets phosphorylated, and then it's either going to be turned into glycogen or used for energy. Whereas with our glucose in our liver, we're going to bring it in and phosphorylate it. But if we need to get that glucose back out, we can dephosphorylate it. And that is a good adaptation. So as you'd suspect, the longer time that we're going to be working and the higher the intensity, the faster we're going to be freeing up that glycogen. And your liver glycogen is not going to be a massive reserve, much less is it going to be a massive amount of reserve you're getting from your muscles. So hence why it probably can support a good hour and a half to two hours of high intensity exercise. And after that, we're talking about supplementation. Now that's if you're going consistent hard outputs. That's why people that run marathons have that issue of hitting the wall. And that's when literally they don't have enough carbohydrates to keep up with aerobic glycolysis. And now they're having to rely heavily on beta oxidation to allow them to keep up their work outputs. Now, we then have what's known as the glucose index. And effectively the glucose index is how rapidly we're gonna break down those carbohydrates and be able to assimilate them into the body. Now, a couple of you guys had questions and one uh, question that I saw on one of the quizzes, which I thought was great, was is there a difference between you know, carbs you're getting from candy as opposed to getting from like complex forms like taking it in through pasta? And the answer is yes and no. Yes, in that obviously the sugar from doing candy is gonna be rapidly in your bloodstream, spiking your blood sugar, and then hopefully going and being uh, taken to where it needs to in the body. Whereas those uh, starches are going to be slower digesting and they're not going to cause as quickly of an acute rise in your blood sugar. And because of this, yes, you're still going to go ahead and absorb all those carbs. The key is how quickly do you go ahead and load things up? And we're going to talk a little bit about why we care about uh, blood glucose and potentially not wanting to spike it, but time and a place. So if you're talking about carbs as a fuel source for just going about your day, you want to do complex carbohydrates. Those are going to be the ones that are slow digesting and they're going to be keeping you more a little bit even keel on your blood sugar. Whereas if you're exercising at a high intensity or you're trying to recover from doing that high intensity exercise, we want to pick a high GI carb because they're going to be rapidly broken down and then obviously brought into the bloodstream where it can then go to the tissues that we're really interested in. Now, carbohydrates are going to be 
important for once again, exercise durations where we know we're going at a high enough intensity that we're going to deplete them. So we do want to load them for competition. And this is going to be a couple days out, meaning we're not going to go ahead and try to just pound out a bunch of pasta like we're Michael Scott before we do our wonderful 5K fun run. Instead, we want to make sure that we're either, there's a couple different approaches, but we're going to be just titrating up the amount of carbohydrates we're taking in post-exercise. We could be talking about anywhere from 50 to 100 grams of carbohydrate, depending on how much we really would have just burned. And then, you know, there's a couple other potential issues. So the graph in the bottom left is from an older, and we're talking 71 research article by Dave Costell and the group out of Ball State, where after doing a 16.1 kilometer, uh, kilometer uh, run, so if we convert that into freedom units, that's about 10 miles, you can see how there was the drastic decrease in muscle glycogen. Now they did the same thing 24 hours later and the same thing 24 hours later. The high carb diet managed to pretty much maintain that glycogen level came down a little bit. Whereas the low carb diet, we can see how it stair steps down each time. And we can only then surmise as well that their performance would have decreased. Now, a lot of people are not trying to run 10 miles an hour or 10 miles every other day. But like anything else, you might have an athlete that's a soccer player that has to play that tournament weekend and they could be a midfielder where they do run a lot. So that's where we're gonna really care about making sure we're taking in a high amount of carbohydrate pre, peri and post exercise. Specifically, when we're looking at our glycogen synthesis rates, notice when you do just carbs, carbs plus protein, or even more carbs with also an addition of protein, we're gonna be able to stair step up how much carbohydrate we're gonna be able to replenish. And notice guys, it's 1.2 grams per kilogram of body mass per hour. And throwing in that extra protein barely gets you much of a difference. So really it's adding the carbohydrates that seems to be the bigger factor in increasing our glycogen synthesis. And that means literally rebuilding and topping off our glycogen stores. So hence for someone about my size, we're talking about what's gonna easily be maybe 108 or so grams of carbohydrate post-workout as a means to really help maximize my glycogen synthesis. So what here uh, we see down in table 6.2 is going to be specifically looking at a soccer player where look at how much the muscle glycogen in both of these athletes from the high carb and the normal diet massively decreased from the beginning to the end of the game. But what's also fascinating guys is when we look at this, take a look at the total distance that was covered by the high carb compared to the normal diet and the percentage of the time spent walking compared to sprinting. So that high carb athlete not only covered more distance but spent considerably greater amounts of time sprinting around the field and less of it walking. And like any sport that you guys have seen before, if you can spend more time sprinting around, moving at high speeds, you're probably gonna be getting more done than if you're moving really slow because you're just exhausted. Because once again, your wonderful glycogen levels are depleted. So we then, I talked on briefly before of how we're gonna do loading. Now there's two different ways to go about it. One of them is absolutely awful, but effective and the other is far more comfortable. I suggest going with option B here. Uh, this is going like Astrin and a couple other uh, approaches. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get a massive, massive amount of glycogen supercompensation, meaning we've got way more glycogen than normal. So one way to go about it is you actually deplete your glycogen. So you go low carb diet, you do a huge amount of training, and then from there, you cut that training for about three days out of the competition and just go, hard in the paint with your carbohydrate intake. So you really get that super compensation. Once again, it's pretty unpleasant. Now, the second option is you slowly titrate up your carbohydrates you're ingesting while you're decreasing your training volume. So that way, when you hit your peak, you're completely essentially saturated out and you're able to also recover because you didn't have to do as much work. Not to mention this workout here, four days out, when you're doing nearly no carbohydrate and you're just doing a depletion run, this is a lot of volume and it's going to be absolutely miserable. So like anything else, when it comes to in practice, we just need to make sure we're giving some information that's going to be useful for the athlete and their lifestyle. So if we're trying to give somebody carbohydrates during their exercise post-workout, 
that's when we want to go for the simpler, easy digesting carbohydrates. This could be literally just drinking fruit juice or doing something like Gatorade. This could be having fruit. This could be having candy. Something that's going to be rapidly digested. Now then throughout the rest of the day, complex form of carbohydrates. You've got your grains, your rice, your potatoes. You've got a myriad of different options you can go ahead and use. And like anything else, we want to match the carbohydrate intake to the athlete. So it's not unheard of to see carbohydrate intakes that are over 10 grams per kilogram of body mass when you're talking about an aerobic athlete that's doing a huge amount of training volume. Now, most folks, usually that three to five grams per kilogram of body mass is like an easy spot to start from, but then we're basing it on performance. Are they bonking? Are they feeling tired? Are they feeling run down? And that's for the aerobic side. The funny thing is also, if you don't have enough glycogen, you're not gonna be able to utilize lactate or essentially produce as much lactate when you're doing your resistance training. And in reality, you might not get effectively as great of a pump from your training. And that's gonna be another indicator that you should probably titrate your carbs up and make sure that we're getting in that carbohydrate pre, peri, and post-workout. And let's actually now talk about the joys of carbs right before we exercise. So your last real meal before you really get after it should probably be somewhere in the neck of three to five hours before you exercise. Now, once we get in that 30 to 60 minutes before exercise range, we actually don't want to really take in a whole lot of carbohydrate because we can start to artificially decrease our blood glucose levels because we've got that carbs that we digested, our body's producing insulin to bring that blood sugar back down. And as soon as you start exercising, you're pulling that blood sugar down even faster and you're actually going to cause premature fatigue. So we might want to do a very light meal one hour beforehand. And then if we're going to do carbs, we actually want to do them about 20 minutes to right when we're starting off. So this would be doing like a goo packet. This would be doing some type of juice or carbohydrate. But once again, it's something light that we're gonna be able to deal with. And remember, when we're exercising, we want those higher GI carbs. When we happen to be doing the rest of our day, that's when we want the lower, di lower GI gonna give us more of that even keel. Now, if we're looking over here, guys, you can see, obviously, if we're doing that higher carbohydrate intake, we in turn are gonna be able to utilize more carbs, go figure. And there is a natural rate limiter on literally how many carbs we give somebody in grams per minute to how much we can break down in grams per minute. And it seems to be about 1.2 grams of carbohydrate uh, per kilogram of body or per minute based upon body size. And it, or not based upon body size, sorry, just based upon time. So we don't want to give too much carbs all at once because even if it's a fast digestion, well, it turns out we still can't turn it over that quickly. And that's going to be limited thanks to the wonderful receptors we have for getting carbohydrates into the body. Notice down here, guys, if we give 1.2 grams of carbohydrate uh, per minute, and then we can see in the dark blue, that's the oxidation only 0.8. So we're not actually able to really use that X or that carbohydrate. If we go and we almost double it, oh, not double it, but we add another 50%, we go to 1.8 grams of carbohydrate per minute. Notice we don't see any change in our oxidation rate. It's when we add fructose to the mix, that's where we're going to see a greater amount of energy turnover. And that's because we're naturally limited on how many carbs we can get through those or how many grams of glucose we can get through those glucose transporters. But then we have our fructose transporter, so we can use that. And even the lactate transporter that you could use for a third source of carbohydrate, but that research really hasn't been done much. Yes, and that's more of the public's connotation towards blood sugar spikes. The way that I like, can, I like to think about carbohydrates when it comes to, you know, just in your diet and using it, think of carbs as effectively the jet fuel. So what do you put jet fuel in? What do you guys put jet fuel in? Yes, jets. What do you think would happen if you put jet fuel in your friend's busted up old car that's barely running? Yes, it would not go well. So when it comes to using energy gels, drink packets, and like I said, simple uh, carbohydrates, I know people that would use their, their post-workout with Skittles. Like, that's cool. I mean, this is the same person who's got run, done running 10 miles. Like, get yourself some carbs. 
fair enough. Something simple, something they enjoy, uh, something their stomach can handle. Absolutely. He's actually one of the world's best um, uh, ultra marathoners. That was like his post-workout doing like a bag of Skittles. Cool. So when you're working with folks, the key is we don't need to do these energy packets and gels and Gatorade. If you're dealing with an older individual that just wants to get in shape, they're not in great physical condition. Now you might have some situations, you might have some McCardles and other very rare situations where people don't break down glycogen like they're supposed to and we won't actually give them carbs when their exercises are keeping them going. But like anything, guys, think of it as kind of the tool in the toolbox. If you're going to go run a marathon, yeah, I want you to know how you're going to be able to tolerate either energy gels, uh, the good old goo blocks, which really is just gummy bears, uh, which we can always just go those instead, or doing like a Gatorade, just how does it tolerate it uh, through the stomach? Because we talked about GI distress previously, you know, how well are they doing with it? And then same thing, if we've got division one athletes and like, okay, what's going to be our carbohydrate source uh, that they're going to drink throughout the game. And then what are they going to try to ingest during uh, halftime? That's not once again, going to mess them up and maybe cause some type of GI issues. But if they're not even energetically spending that much, then we're not going to worry about it. So, you know, to pick on specifically, you know, with uh, Tori, um, how many, how many games are you pitching per week? Uh, probably like one full game. We have quite a few oh. pitchers. Okay. And then, sorry, how many pitches? Uh, over 200 probably. And then each bullpen is probably close to 120 or 200 pitches. Rock and roll. So on those times, absolutely. Now, if you know it's the game that you're not even playing, do you really need to worry about carbs? No. Yeah, exactly. So it's just, it's apply the right tool in the toolbox. And also we're not just trying to, you know, force fuel down our uh, athletes face when they're like, I'm not hungry. I don't need this. Like, why are you punishing me with food? So remember guys, once we go ahead and start exercising, now we're not getting as good of blood flow to our digestive tract. So we can only break down carbohydrates at a given rate. And that rate is going to obviously be limited as we go up higher and higher in our exercise intensity. So we need to keep in mind, obviously, how much carb we're giving them. The type, is it complex? Is it simple? And then obviously the form, is it just a drink? Is it a gel? Is it a bar? And if we're going 100% all out, you're not going to be eating anything because you're going to probably see that meal uh, before it's ever going to really get inside of your body because it is quite difficult to break that down. So it seems to be that we're not going to really be able to get too much over that 1.2 grams of carbohydrate per minute. If you're really working with a long distance athlete and we're trying to optimize for something like a marathon, then we want to play around with it. Like, okay, okay, let's see if they can tolerate 60 grams. So you think 1.2, multiply that by 60 minutes. Now we're looking at a grand total of a good old 72 grams of carbs per hour. Okay, well, figure out how many goo packets that is. Maybe try to push it up a little bit, see if they tolerate it. And maybe they don't tolerate it and try the initial one pack and then maybe we got to titrate it down. And so remember, when we're using different types of carbohydrates, meaning fructose with the glucose, we're going to be able to take more in. And then as far as metabolic effects, it just tends to make you use carbs more as a fuel source when you're taking them in. And that's fine because we're actually wanting to turn over energy pretty uh, aggressively. Now, we're trying to burn fat then potentially we're not going to worry so much about that carbohydrate supplementation. And if anything, remember the first thing we're going to try and do is get them in a caloric deficit. Now, uh, during a game with simple carbs be better than a complex. Um, it depends on what type of game we're talking about. So if it's in specific reference to the sport of softball, choose sunflower seeds. Who cares? You don't even need carbs. It's not that hard. No, but in all seriousness, probably more of a simple carbohydrate something that's pretty easy for you to go ahead and uh, it's usually always going to be the better bet no matter what you're doing because you can obviously digest it pretty easily. Um, complex carbohydrates, more that's what you'd want to do far away uh, from that workout. And then also keep in mind, it's not just the type of carbohydrate. It's always going to be the amount is the first thing to really worry about because obviously if we're doing a massive bolus of carbohydrate and our body's not ready for it, you're going to have a bad time as I'm sure all of you guys have learned 
and we haven't gotten to the hydration chapter yet, but I'm sure all of you guys have tried to drink too much water during a break whenever you're uh, you know, playing a sport in the heat or in the sun, and then you started cramping up, you, know, you started having that GI distress because once again, you don't have the blood flow going to that area. So that's one of those things you've got to, we start with our initial scientific foundations. Then we realize everybody is different and we make modifications based upon tolerance. Some folks are able to tolerate food pretty well. Some folks can't. Um, how many of you guys know if you try to eat anything before you go for a run, you're going to cramp up. So you know you've got to effectively get that last meal in two plus hours outside of it. Yeah. And so it's not that, uh, you know, you guys are bad people because that's the way it works. The key is, you know, your body, you know, how your body responds. So let's make sure that we're setting everything up in a way that's going to allow our athletes to perform at a high level without having GI distress, because no one likes being under GI distress. No one likes worrying about being, um, uh, be suddenly wearing the brown pants and no one likes vomiting from exercise. Well, rephrase, there's probably some people that are in each of those things, but I don't want to think about it. And I really, I really would suggest never Googling it because I'm sure that's going to be one of those things you want to save search on. So after exercise, now remember guys, we've massively increased the amount of GLUT4 transporters on the cellular surface of the muscle fibers that were used heavily in that exercise. So now we can take advantage of an improvement of our glucose and debatably our insulin sensitivity. So we want to go ahead and make sure we're taking in those carbs as fast as possible. So if you guys can see over here where we've got calcium, AKA what we're gonna release really good muscles contract is gonna cause the GLUT4 transporters to translocate to the surface as will the same effect occur through insulin. So between both these powers combined, you're gonna be able to rapidly regenerate your, your glycogen. And this seems to actually happen within that two hours after exercise. That's when we got the fastest rate of glycogen synthesis. So we want to make some decisions there that are gonna help. Now you're still gonna have an increased glycogen synthesis rate for could be as high as 48 hours or more after our exercise, but it's gonna be nowhere near as quickly as if we would have did those carbs immediately. So that's why if you've got an athlete that's training multiple times per day, or you've got to get ready for multiple competitions, using post-workout carbohydrate intake is a great choice. Now remember, at the same time, Whenever we ingest anything, it's in our mouth, it's in our esophagus, it's in our stomach, it's in our stomach, do I go on through the chain? So whatever we put in here, start the clock, it's usually going to take about 20 minutes till it's actually fully in your bloodstream so it can be utilized. So like anything else, we want to make sure that we're taking in those carbs immediately afterwards and or near the tail end of that practice session if it can be tolerated. Now, the type of carbohydrate, this is where we want to go simple. This is where we want to go ahead and do fruit, do juice, do carbohydrate beverages, anything that's going to allow it to be rapidly taken up into the body and with minimal distress that happens to come with it. Now, if we're doing protein with it, that can maybe increase our glycogen resynthesis, but the bigger use here, guys, is you're going to be able to take in those, not just the carbs, but the protein into your muscles to actually help your muscles, not just replenish glycogen, but also allowing you to now help rebuild the muscular damage that you probably did as well. And as far as the source, if we want to use a solid or a liquid, well, now we're getting down to preference here. Now, if you would prefer to do your all of your food in solid form, that's fine. Liquid just tends to be a little bit easier. It tends to be a little bit more portable. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with doing whole, fo whole food choices the key is, once again, what do people tolerate? What do they enjoy? So let's talk about the joys of blood glucose levels. Why do we care about blood glucose levels, folks? Who wants to go ahead and take a shot at it? Why do we care about blood glucose levels? <laughs> hmm. 
Yeah, low blood sugar, if we go too low, we're literally talking about our nervous system isn't gonna function because that's what it prefers as carbohydrates to fuel source. You can use things uh, like ketone bodies, but you gotta be to the point of which you can actually utilize them and ketosis can take a little bit of time to get into. But the other bigger issue is with that high carbohydrate levels, we can get carbohydrates literally bonding to things where it shouldn't. And this is what's known as glycosylation. So glycosylated proteins and metabolites that in turn can literally cause inflammation throughout the body, can cause damage to your endothelium, increase risks of a number of negative health outcomes. So this would be kind of uncontrolled uh, diabetes as far as with high blood sugars. And that's why we wanna make sure we keep that blood sugar without going too high. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So like anything else, we want it to be tightly controlled. And well, we know exercise is a good way to bring down blood glucose levels, which obviously can bring them too low. And you might have somebody that happens to be type one diabetic or otherwise you need to work with, make sure they're working with a dietitian, make sure they understand their body and they're checking their blood sugars before, during, and even after exercise to make sure they're not gonna dip too low. Now, on the other side, if we're too high, yeah, that's where we're running the risk of a lot of those more long-term negative health effects from uncontrolled uh, diabetes. So literally the carbohydrates bond a thing that they shouldn't along with effectively kind of form for lack of a better term, little crystal lancets that will go into and do damage to your endothelium. So uh, yeah, you don't wanna to go too high on those carbs. But now let's have a little fun with carbohydrates, okay? So we've got four different scenarios, okay? Your goal is to optimize the carbohydrate intake around their day, given what they're doing. So group one, you've got the 500 grams of carbs divided over the course of the day for the bodybuilder, putting this up in the chat so you guys can see it, and lifting weights for two hours in the afternoon. So how are we gonna divide up those carbs throughout their day? What are we trying to do as far as loading it uh, pre, peri, post workout? And what's kind of the overall goal there? We've got that triathlete that's got the distance in the evenings and the mornings. How much are we talking? Think about how we want to make sure we're not oversaturated whenever they're doing that training. Same thing when we have the soccer player. And then at the final option, we have a fitness competitor. So this is going to be someone that's not doing a lot of carbs. And how are we going to try to optimize them to allow them to get the best performance around what they're really caring about, what they're trying to do. So we're only worrying about the carbohydrates part of their diet, but here's the wrinkle. I want you guys to do two different variations of it, okay? One is gonna be the straightforward breakdown. And once again, here's how you're gonna do it. Here's how, or sorry, you're gonna give us the grams of carbs. But then from there, I want you guys to figure out the food sources you wanna use because we've got the lower GI carbs and the higher GI carbs, okay? I want you to do one that you consider the high tier, the I'm trying to do this in a healthier way, meaning the bodybuilder is going to be eating a combination of rice and uh, potatoes, both sweet and uh, white potatoes. Then we're gonna have the what I like to call colloquially as the D-bag nutrition variation of it. And that's where the bodybuilder is going to do a bag of Skittles post-workout, okay? They are gonna get in their carbohydrates from Twinkies throughout the day, have fun with it and try to figure out, once again, serving sizes, how much of each of these nutrients we're looking for. Do you guys have questions over your expectations of what you guys are gonna work on? Does that seem straightforward? You guys ready to go have a little fun breaking down some diet stuff, then we'll come back and talk it through. It's 6.36, the goal is that we're gonna meet back at effectively, I'll give you, uh, cause you guys gotta figure out how we're gonna divide the carbohydrates in a way that optimizes recovery for that athlete, given the goals of the session. And from there, trying to price it out for the sources and what we're trying to do. So figure 636, we'll try to get back at 650. So questions, comments, concerns, you guys ready to go? Or both maybe, you ever hear anything? Okay, so. Breakout rooms are open. Go ahead and hop in there, guys. Remember which scenario you're going to be working with, depending on the number you've got.
Donovan, are you having trouble getting into your group? Oh, I haven't been recording any of this, so huh? that's fun for those that missed. Um, for the triathlete, yeah, of trying to divide it relatively evenly. I would be interested to see what type of would be the carb sources you'd be doing for each of those parts. So yeah, I guess going for more complex carbohydrates for all the meals and then simple for the actual training. Um, oh God, and the Coke, Oreos, pizzas, and two Snickers. America, way to go freedom on it. But yeah, Nathan's group, good work. Like I said, I would still like to see what these serving sizes look like, look like guys and how that's gonna match what we're looking for. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, good work breaking down the basics of what we're looking for as far as nutritionally with carbohydrates of trying to space them out throughout the day, taking in in the simple forms immediately before peri and post-workout, complex for the rest of the day. And if anything, we might have a couple meals if we've got very low carbohydrate intake, but we don't get to do carbs. We're just gonna do some um, protein and fat, and that's about it. But we're going to get more into obviously those macronutrients as we go on. So just uh, one last thing we're going to have you guys go ahead and do. And we're going to have you guys in those same groups where uh, obviously we're looking through our literature review. So one thing to remember, guys, I'm trying to summarize the information we're coming up with. And when you guys are getting with yours, the things that I was seeing is we were not doing a lot of quantified variables. So like how big an effect is this diet, does this approach have on people's performance and making sure that we're going to try to think about, okay, how big of an effect it does have and then try to think, make a table where you kind of go study one, they used supplement A, it gained, or individuals in there gained an extra 5% strength. Sub, uh, study B, same supplement, maybe the dosage was different and they made no changes. And so you've got this table where you can kind of compare everything. It makes for a great visual. That's really easy to see. And don't be afraid to obviously cite, but take some of the graphs and figures out of the articles you're reading and incorporate them there. So the last thing we're going to go ahead and have you guys do is we're going to go ahead and try to have a little bit of fun. Okay. So in your group, you guys have got that 10 grams of carbohydrates, you see, or 10 grams per kilogram of body mass per day, four grams. And then also where we can do a post workout. Well, instead, because we've got groups of mostly three, okay, we're only going to do the first three options. So we're going to go your largest team member, smallest, and 40 grams of fiber is just whatever. So the basic idea is the largest person in your group figure out, okay, if we're doing 10 grams of carbohydrate per kilogram of body mass, how many grams of carbs are we talking? Okay, so now how are we gonna divide that up over, we're gonna say you can do it over three to four meals. And same thing as me with that four grams per kilogram body mass of the small individual. Okay, now what does that, just the carbohydrate side of their diet look like? So, okay, let's say, I'm use myself as an example. We got somebody that's about 95, 96 kilos. So that means I would need 950 to 960 grams of carbohydrate a day. And if I can did that over just three meals, now we're talking 320 grams of carbohydrate per meal. So how many bowls of Cheerios am I gonna have to pound down? How many slices of bread? How many pounds of potatoes? So really thinking through, you know, how many cups of rice are we gonna need so that we're going to get that intake to that level? Now, then on the other side, when we have that smaller individual, okay, we're dividing that over three meals. How little is that really per meal? What does that really work out to over the course of that day? So have real examples of serving sizes and the foods that you would choose. And then when it comes to 40 grams of fiber per day, what would be, no, oh God, you could just be like, I take 40 grams of psyllium uh, husk fiber supplement. I wouldn't necessarily go with that. But instead, like, okay, this is how I would do it. So I would take in 40 grams of fiber by eating like two avocados and, you know, some spinach and this, that, or the other. But dividing each of those up, and then we're going to come back, talk about it. It's pretty much seven o'clock. We're going to plan on coming back at uh, 715 at the latest. And then we'll go ahead and see what you guys came up with. Does that make sense? Everybody feel pretty comfortable with what I'm asking?
Awesome. All right. Well, get back in those groups, guys. Have some fun with your group mates and make it happen. All right, Brent, way to get after it. Yeah, and those totals were just like the 34 cups brown rice. That was that equaled the 110 grams per day. So it wasn't all three of them combined. Yeah, you know, I, I, I inferred. I can, I can, yeah, I was just like, oh boy. Yeah, but, uh, you know, seriously, though, that's, that's good work. Yeah, you broke that down. So that's the thing. If you think about an athlete, like a cross country athlete that's chewing through, like it's insane. Like the idea of you have to go through not one, but four and a half boxes of honey nut Cheerios per day. And oh man, and don't be wrong, you know, the milk with it would also be some carbs. And I'm sure you would eat more than just that. But man, now uh, for Chris's, yeah, really not that bad. If you're just doing some potatoes, ketchup, and a uh, grilled cheese and some soup, that's yeah, that sounds like a nice, nice day, nice day. <laughs> Um, Nathan's group, as far as you're trying to get the fiber in, nice choice. Yeah, surprisingly, uh, potatoes can give you a decent amount, but, but legumes is the place to go if you're really looking for massive fiber loads. And uh, way to go, uh, no offense, Katie, but uh, cliche uh, millennial with avocado toast, but is a, uh, is a good source of fiber. None I've way. honestly never even tried it. That's okay. It's okay. I haven't either. I'm sure it's everything that uh, people would like it to be. Y'all are missing out. Of course, you, yeah, Alex, you would know what it's like. Yeah, because you were eating that the other day in the lab. We had that because I was giving trouble about it. It's primo with uh, everything bagel seasoning on top. That's how you really need to have it. Oh, you guys, you, you rich kids and your, and your avocados, man. Funny thing is avocados actually used to be a food that was mostly supposed to be for, it was, it was for poor people. It was looked down on to eat avocados because you couldn't afford butter. So avocados were considered uh, poor man's butter. And obviously we see how those tables have turned as time has gone on. Okay, so, whew, yeah, that's, uh, that's getting after it with the uh, baked potatoes. Now, obviously the size of the baked potato can be a thing, but doing the bagels and the Mars bars. So I guess we now know what uh, type of candy Tori's a fan of. Uh, and one serving of Oreo cookies, which is probably only two cookies, which to me is sad, but you can always do the sleeve challenge if you really feel like hurting yourself. Uh, nice trending. Yep, that's, um, that's a lot of spaghetti, but that would get you to those levels you need. <laughs> I can respect that, Randall. I can respect that. Oh, man. I did not mean to send that, nor. No, I that's really okay, Kevin. Okay. I was typing out my largest person and then I hit the return to room button and now it's gone. I promise yeah. it was great. I okay, promise. so just give us the breakdown that you came up with. Okay, so we needed 930 grams of carbs for the whole day. For yeah. breakfast, I had nine specifically four inch pancakes because that was, that was what was on the box. Okay. And then I had... Um, what else did I have? Oh, I had like eight servings of oatmeal, just a huge bowl, like mixing bowl type of oatmeal. Yeah. And then that was breakfast. Lunch, I had like eight servings of ramen noodles and then like a whole box of pasta. I didn't put the sauce, but there would be sauce on it. Mm -hmm. And then dinner was in progress, but I was really getting there. I was at like 700 calories before that happened 700 grams of the carbs yeah 700 grams that's what i meant yeah I in there. I so i mean it's i'm sure you guys you guys might be do you guys remember the whole michael phelps diet that kind of made the rounds a number of years ago when obviously he was competing at the olympics and talking about how many calories you do per day you guys remember that at all no yeah so it's like an absurd amount like of everything yeah. Yeah, it was about, he was doing a little over 8,000 calories a day because he was swimming in a pool like three to four hours a day, along with doing weight training outside of that and some other cross training. So like his caloric demand, like it was pretty much all that dude did when he wasn't swimming was eat. And that's, you know, sandwiches, 
pasta, you know, just pounding down calories. And it's truly rare you're going to encounter someone like it. But like anything else, at least you got a working idea of, okay, this is how many grams of carbs we have in a serving of this. So if you're trying to go immediately post-workout, nice, Lewis. I like that setup there. That's not bad. I mean, that's, a, that's a lot of uh, Cokes, but you know, I'm not going to yuck your yum. You do what you got to do in order to get yourself to the level you need to get to. But like anything else, we're always just trying to match the intake to the demands that we have with our athlete. Alex, you don't mind yourself when you have a moment, bud. So we're just going to make sure that we're giving someone an adequate amount of calories. And then from there, we're going to start looking at the macronutrients. So guess what athlete of all the macronutrients, the next one that becomes the most important is carbohydrates. Who do you think that's going to be guys? Who do you think it's going to be that we need to just pound down? We need to focus on carbohydrates after we look at total calories. Throw out an idea, guys. If you're wrong, you're wrong. Who cares? Yeah, endurance athletes. Absolutely. You know, if we're working with the cross-country kids and we're doing a dietary recall, after we look at total calories, my eyes are going straight to carbohydrates. And then maybe we'll care about protein. If we're working with a basketball player, a soccer player, a rugby athlete, um, even your volleyball players. And yes, I know I threw a little bit of shade earlier at softball, but we're probably going to prioritize carbohydrates in the diet before we prioritize protein. Now, if we're working with somebody where we're trying to lean them up, that's when we're going to care a lot more about protein. And especially obviously for a resistance training individual, a real strength power athlete. Okay. Yeah. There's that point to which, yeah, we're going to care about not just uh, carbohydrates, but obviously we're looking at protein as well, but we're going to cover that more obviously in the future. That's everything that I wanted to make sure that I went through with you guys and you guys could try a little hands-on and have a little fun. Does anyone have any questions, comments, concerns? Otherwise we'll call it a night. I just have a question about the food budgets. Yeah, go for like it. Assignment. Um, just on the, like I submitted mine and you said, be sure to still break down the macros for each day as well. What do you want us to do for that? Okay. So, you know, I'll pull it up on my side so I can see it, but uh, effectively when you're doing that breakdown. Okay. So, okay. When we're looking at, yeah. So we just did number two. So hence notice you need at least 200 grams of protein, 75 grams of fat and 200 grams of carbs along with vitamin D, K, and enough magnesium and iron. So I just wanna see what they took in for each of those meals. So we're still caring about those. And obviously, you know, the micros are important as well. So for the next one you guys got coming up where we've got the same thing where we need certain amounts of protein, carbs, and fats, but the next one is literally no budget, but you can only eat at a select number of fast food restaurants. So it's going to be, the nice thing is you'll be able to find those menus online. And I only want you guys to be at about 3000 calories per day. It is easy to shoot the moon with this, meaning go way, way higher than you need to. So make sure you're keeping that in mind. And okay. then- Cause sorry for mine. Um, I included like the grams of protein, grams of carbs and grams of fat. And I hit all of those. So I didn't know if you wanted anything else in, like on top of that. Oh, just making sure you're breaking it down by food, not by meal. Okay. Does that make sense? So for each, each different um, food that I use, do you want each individual? Bingo, bingo. Because when it's all okay. together, I want to make, because like anything else, sometimes I'll see something wild, like how is there 10 grams of protein coming from broccoli? Okay. It doesn't sound right. And so, you know, I can kind of figure out where somebody maybe went off the rails. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. I mean, these are not meant to be punitive and super hard assignments, but more or less just, you know, see how things are going, see how people are progressing, see if we all understand. So any other questions, comments, concerns, guys? Dr. Lynn, I wanted to ask you real quick. So we always talk about like how we have to reach a certain amount of cards per day. Um, how do we know for the card 
that we're ingesting is actually going to like restore our glycogen stores and not be turned into fat. Oh, so now we go into the fear. Now, in all reality, in excess of any nutrient, specifically we're talking about carbs and fat, is in turn going to cause an accretion of fat mass. So you're right. Like anything else, if we take in too many carbs, we're going to be converting that over into body fat. So hence why we're just trying to match demands. We're not trying to overshoot them. So, you know, like anything else, and there's a number of approaches. One is to start with a set carbohydrate intake, follow your training. Do you get fluffier? Do you gain muscle mass? What's going on? How are you training over a period of time? Now, after that first week, you got fluffier and you've had good pumps and good uh, workouts. Let's titrate those, those carbs a little bit. And one week is pretty fast to say you got fluffy. So maybe you want to wait more like a month or two. Now, the other side could be true is that like, God, your workouts were just dog crap. You weren't able to hit the weights hard. You were gassing out super early. Okay, let's titrate those carbs up. But the first and foremost, we got to have a good idea of how many carbs we're doing per day. And then once we've got a good wrap on our normal carbohydrate intake, that can inform us in either direction. So it is a pretty difficult thing to parse. Absolutely, if you take in too many, you're likely to go ahead and now be gaining the type of mass you don't want to. But I want you to focus instead on, okay, how much am I taking in habitually? Now, what am I training with my training? If I'm now training a lot more, doing a lot, of, a lot more lifting, a lot of more cardio, I need to up my carbohydrate intake, unless I'm trying to lose weight, then that could be another consideration there. And so... It's no like easy, like rule of thumb, like you need exactly 3.47 grams of carbohydrate per kilogram of body mass of which 78% of it should be complex. 12% uh, of it should be simple and the remainder being fiber. It's not that easy. Instead, okay, let's focus on how many grams we take in per day. Now, how has our performance been? And then we bring the carbs up, we bring the carbs down. And then we also keep that in mind of our total caloric intake. So, Please ask a follow-up question because I don't know if that was a good answer. Yeah, that was good. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well then, you guys have a great night. Stay safe out there and I will see you guys uh, next week. So bye-bye.